Okay, next talk for today. Please welcome Romain, who's going to explain us what is reactive programming. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Romain Picard, and uh, I will talk about reactive programming. So it's been a long day, but uh, please uh, stay awake, at least for the next 20 minutes. Uh, so the presentation uh, will start with an introduction on uh, reactive programming, and more specifically, uh, reactivex. Then I will go through a simple example on how to use it. Uh, and we'll see how to deal with errors and uh, how to deal with concurrency. And I will conclude with a more realistic example on how uh, ReactiveX can be used uh, uh, in, uh, with uh, something that we use to, to deploy our uh, machine learning models. Uh, just before we start, let me introduce myself. So I'm a data scientist at Softatom. And Softatom, we are a medium-sized company where we develop firmwares for uh, internet routers, uh, TV decoders, and vocal assistants. So most of our, our developers are embedded developers uh, doing C and C++. But on my team, we are doing almost exclusively Python. Uh, I'm also one of the developers of the RxPy library. And uh, I am also the author of a book on, uh, on this topic. So let's go and uh, let's start with just a, a simple poll. How many of you already used the reactive programming before? Raise your hand. Yeah. Five, ten people. Okay, that's great. Uh, did you use ReactiveX for the few that used it? No. Yes, one, maybe. Okay. So you're the, the correct audience for uh, today, for me. That's fine. Uh, so to... To say it simply, and maybe in a vague way, uh, reactive programming its one way to write even-driven code. So it's, uh, it's not really tied to a programming language or paradigm. You can use it with uh, imperative programming or object-oriented programming or functional programming. You can use it with, let's say, almost any programming language. Uh, it's really just a way to structure code. And, uh, it's uh, done in a way that you write a computation graph. So uh, on the right, you have some, uh, some example of a graph that you can do. And uh, the nodes uh, represent uh, computations that are done, transformations. And the edges are, uh, represent uh, data flow. So uh, basically, you just write a computation graph. And the transformation will apply to each item that flow to, uh, to, to this uh, stream of events. So you can write a cyclic graph, like on the top, but also cycle graph. And in general, when you have a, a real application, you have both in it. You have, uh, it's mostly a, an acyclic graph, but with some parts that contain some cycles. ReactiveX is one of the most used libraries to, uh, where it's a very uh, uh, used one. It was originally developed by Microsoft, and it's been open-sourced in 2012. And since, since then, it's been written in many different languages. Uh, and uh, RxPy is the Python implementation of ReactiveX. Uh, last summer, we released uh, the version 3 of this library. And uh, it's a major uh, release, uh, mainly due to the fact that we use uh, the pipe operator you will see later what it means. But uh, uh, the big thing is, is that it makes it much more easy to write your own operators and to uh, extend uh, the library. Another great thing is that we now have a documentation. So that's fine. Uh, that's really great, because before you had to read the code to see how it works. So now you can read the doc online. So that's something that is really great, I think. Uh, and we dropped the support for Python 2. But anyway, nobody's using it now, I suppose. So this shouldn't be an issue. Uh, so if you want to understand what is ReactiveX, you basically need to understand three things. Uh, the first one is what is an observable. An observable is just another name for a stream of events. 
And uh, by the way, we do not name events events, but usually we name them items. So an observable is something that emits some items. The se second thing you have to know is what's an observer. So if you use uh, object-oriented programming, you probably already heard this term. And by the way, it's uh, the same meaning. Uh, an observer is uh, an entity that will receive some items. So it's some, something that subscribes to an observable and will receive its time times. Uh, by the way, ReactiveX, it's more or less the observer design patterned, but implemented in a functional way instead of an object-oriented way. And when you combine uh, observables and uh, observers, uh, you can write operators. So an operator is a transformation that is done on the events that are uh, emitted by the observables. So let's see with an example. So this is what we call a marble diagram. Uh, it's similar to a UML sequence diagram, but rotated. So the arrows represent observables. So here on the top, there's an observable that emits items one, two, three, and four. Uh, the rectangles represent the operator. So here it's the map operator and uh, the map operator takes a function as a parameter and it applies this function to each items that it receives. So in this example, uh, the function just decreases the value. So when item one is emitted, it goes through the map operator, the value is decreased and the map operator emits on a new observable the value zero. And so we have this for all items that, that are emitted by the, the observer. Sorry, the observable. And so on this example, at the end, the map operator emits 0, 1, 2, 3. The nice thing here is that the type of the input, it's an observable, but the type of the output, it's also an observable. So operators take observables as input and also as output. So this is what makes them easy to plug them together. And basically, when you write a ReactiveX application, you just plug many, observe, uh, many operators together, and that's how you write your computation graph. So let's see with an example. We'll write a very simple graph where we will chain only two operators. So this is another kind of diagram that I call a reactivity diagram. It's inspired from uh, UML activity diagrams, but the meaning is different. In an activity diagram, you represent a code flow. Here, uh, the, the diagram represents a data flow. So on the top, you have a source observable. The, the black dot represents a source, and the items will flow through it. Through it. it will, we will first use the map operator to decrease the values of items that are emitted. And then we will use the filter operator to keep only the event values. And then the result will be an observable that emits the result of these two transformations. So this program is something that does not really have a start and an, an end time-wise. It will uh, start when uh, the, the observable uh, is uh, started. And it will end only if the source observable finishes at some time, which may not be the case depending on the source that we use. So let's see this with some code. So we start with a few imports to get the ReactiveX uh, uh, models loaded. There's one for the, all the base functions, and another one dedicated for, to get all the operators that are available. We create an observable, in this case, from a list. So in a real case, usually the source is something that comes uh, from an I.O. Uh, like a network connection, or it could be uh, some, uh, a timer that will tick every, every second or things like that, or it can be a user input from a UI. But here, for an example, we create a, a hard-coded observable that will emit items 1, 2, 3, 4. Then we will declare the compute computation graph that we want to do on this observable. So this is where we use the pipe method on the source observable. And we will just chain the map operator and the filter operator. 
So on the map operator, we tell it to decrease the value for each item that, that are emitted. And then the filter operator, we tell it to keep only the event values. So the values whose modulus 2 is 0. The result of this call is also an observable. So what source.pipe returns, it's also an observable. So if I run it this way, nothing happens because we just have something that created observables, but nothing is executed yet. We just declared the compute computation graph that we want to do. So observables are lazy. They only emit items when somebody subscribes to them. So that's we, what we have to do next. We subscribe to this observable. And uh, in our case, we just print each value that, uh, that is emitted at the end. So we used the on next callback to, in our case, print the value. And there are two other callbacks that are available to be notified when the observable completes or when an error occurs. And uh, this subscription function returns a disposable object that can be used to unsubscribe from the observable. So that's all. Here we've got our first sample, but with almost everything that you have to know to write a reactive code. So if you execute this, uh, the source observable, we start emitting item one. It will go through the map operator that will decrease the value. So the item becomes, becomes zero. Then it goes through the filter operator. Zero is an even value, so it will be printed on the subscription callback. Then item two is emitted. Two minus one, it's one. One is not an even value, so it will be dropped, and nothing will be printed. Then three is emitted. Three minus one is two. Two is an even value, so two will be printed. And four is emitted. Four minus one is three. Three is not an even value, so it will also be dropped. So you've got this at the end. Pretty simple. But the important thing here is that, as you can see, you have small computation blocks, and the power comes from the combination of them. You can combine them in many ways and build really complex graphs with complex computations in a quite easy way, with events that, uh, that are uh, asynchronous by nature. So what, it, what we did here was simple, and it seems that it... Uh, too simple to be uh, realisti re realistic. Uh, but in fact, when we connected our uh, two, two operators together, we did not uh, make a single connection. So that's one important thing to know, and it's uh, an interesting thing to handle errors with uh, ReactiveX. So basically, when we connect operators together, there are two connections that are done. There's one, uh, one happy pass where the items are emitted. So if everything goes well, the items flow through the happy pass. So the map operator takes uh, items from the happy pass and outputs them on it, uh, as well as the filter one. But if anything uh, wrong happens, there's also a failure pass that allows to propagate errors and stop all the data flow. So typically, if there's an error that occurs in the map operator, this error will not propagate through the happy path, but through the error path. And then all operators that are after in the graph can handle this error in a graceful way and uh, do more or less complex things on it. So this means that we've what we've just implemented with no special logic to handle errors, it natively handles them. So, for example, if we replace our source observable and uh, the second item, we replace uh, the integer with a string, something wrong will happen because on the map operator, we will try to decrease a string and this is not allowed in Python. So, what happens is just this. We first get the item one that is emitted and decreased. This works well. But when the string is emitted, the map operator raises an exception, and this exception is propagated through the filter operator. In this case, 
the filter operator does nothing but just forwards it and it goes up until the subscription error callback. And after that, nothing happens because once uh, an observable has completed, either on success or on failure, there's no items that can flow after that. So that's why we don't have uh, the value uh, 2 that is also emitted after that. So that's one sim simple case, but it's one of the uh, very usual way to handle errors. There's something wrong, we do something, and we just stop the program. Um, there are some other operators that are available to do more complex things on errors, uh, but that's really the base way of how it's managed, and it, it allows to handle many cases uh, already, and in an easy way. Another thing that can be done uh, with uh, with RxPy on ReactiveX is a, an easy way to deal with concurrency. So this is done with what uh, we call schedulers. So you can uh, handle different types of concurrency. CPU concurrency with uh, thread pools or uh, threads that are created on demand. We can also deal with IO concurrency. We support several kinds of uh, event loops, such as async IO, but also uh, some other ones, like twisted G-event. And uh, there's also some built-in support for uh, several frameworks that uh, have main loops, such as Qt and GTK. So uh, the thing that is interesting here also, just like most of the things in ReactiveX, ReactiveX is that it's extensible. So you can write your own schedulers and do other kinds of scheduling if you, if you need it. I don't have an example here because it would use too much time. Uh, but you can see on the documentation there are many examples on uh, how to use it. Uh, so how can we use it in real life? Uh, that's a typical example on uh, how uh, my team deploy machine learning model on our uh, backend. Uh, so each model is deployed as a Docker container and uh, we use PyPy uh, as, the, as an interpreter. We use AsyncIO for all the input-output management. We use RxPy for all the feature engineering and uh, model execution. And uh, we use another small framework that is called Cyclo Cyclotron that is used to separate the IOs from the, the, the data flow. So this is a case where everything works really well together because we, on our backend, we use Kafka as, a, as an event, uh, uh, as a source and a destination on events. So everything that we do, we read events from Kafka, we do some computation, and we write the result to Kafka. And we have many microservices that are chained together this way. So on a typical uh, deployment, we have our uh, service that runs with RxPy for the really the computation part, it receives events from Kafka with IO Kafka. So we have a, a Kafka consumer that is done with AsyncIO. It receives some configuration with uh, Consul. Consul, it's a, it's a tool that allows to deal with configuration and, it, and it's uh, exposed via REST APIs. The result of the computations is exposed on a Kafka topic, and we also expose some uh, uh, operational metrics with Prometheus. And so this is uh, an example that uh, is uh, simple, but it can uh, deal with quite complex ways, uh, because the Kafka source here, there's a single uh, arrow, but it can be a combination of several topics so we can read uh, many topics at the same time, combine them together with RxPy, and do uh, all our computation. Uh, and this is a case where all these elements uh, fit very well together. Kafka with AsyncIO and RxPy, it's really things that do great things with each part, each other. Uh, so that's all for me. Uh, if you want more uh, on this, you can uh, just play with it. You just pimp install Rx, and you've got it. The documentation is available on Read the Doc. You've got some more generic information on ReactiveX. Uh, ReactiveX. And uh, I also added a link to a presentation by uh, Scott Vlashling, 
for the, all the error management on the railway uh, analogy. This is really a great talk that he did a few years ago. Uh, I suggest that you read it if you're interested in the, in the topic. Thank you very much. Don't be shy with the question. The first three people asking questions will have a copy of, uh, of my book. Does it, does it support MycoPython? Uh, I did not try it. Uh, okay, let's talk together it, later because I, I have done something with reactive programming, but uh, I had to use uh, Rx Lua, and I wanted to switch to Rx Pi with MycoPython. So. Sorry, I didn't hear the... So the, the first question was, that, does it support MicroPython? Uh, yeah. Louder, please. So the question was, does it support MicroPython? That's, that's it? <laughs> Yeah, his question was, does it support MicroPython? Yes, I didn't try it, but from what I saw on MicroPython, uh, it, it may work. I, I'm not sure that there are things that are not supported by it that should not work, but I didn't even test it. Yeah. So, um, I have two questions, please. So, uh, what you showed us, I, mean, I think, in slide 14 it was a contrived uh, example that you had uh, a brain the data source. Uh, you had a brain data source, which is a uh, static list. So, my question is, uh, what is the main the default uh, execution model? Is it async? No, so, the, de the default model execution is uh, everything is running on the uh, on the interpreter main thread, on, but then you can change it and use uh, an SNKU event loop or uh, a Qt event loop if you if you want. So we can talk after. Maybe. Ah. Uh, so my question is, what would you recommend to manage complexity of large pipelines? It's so great when you write through two or three steps in a pipeline, but it gets very large, like 15, 20 elements, and half a year passes, and you need to adjust something in seven steps. How do you manage complexity? Yeah, uh, the way to manage complexity with uh, this kind of code is the same one than uh, usual way. So you split your code in many small functions that wrap uh, smaller pieces of operations and so that you've got some uh, really, uh, you use composition to get some small elements that are combined together. So at the end you, you have one graph that should stay simple, but each element in it is also another graph that has other computation and you can deal it with, with it this way. You have to compose all the operators together to do higher uh, level comp computation. Otherwise, yes, you can uh, quickly get a very big things on the uh, hard to manage. How do, you yeah. <laughs> how do you deal with? Uh, uh, how do you deal with uh, um, concurrency access to uh, to a data structure between the different uh, pipelines? Uh, concur concurrency is not. Uh, it's, it's, it's managed via schedulers. So the, each, each operator does not handle concurrency in itself. So it assumes that everything is executing on the same thread. But, yes, but if you need to combine things that can come from multiple threads, uh, there are some schedulers that are dedicated to it and that can serialize access. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to then uh, the, the next step of uh, the computation graph. Exactly. You have to combine the inputs in some way. Yes.